Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by the fantastic Ricardo Martinez and Jerry, uh, my co-hosts, but much more importantly than us, uh, we have a great guest today, Econo Alchemist, uh, Monica online, sometimes burn the bridge, uh, a Bitcoiner who informs uh, others on things such as self-custody, censorship resistant, uh, mining at home, privacy, the list goes on. I'm sure there's much more to you. But um, how are you doing today, man, Econo? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Stoked to be here. Uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, so we're very happy to have you. And uh, I've got a question to start off hot right off the bat. I have no idea what your opinion is going to be on this, but uh, you can't ignore it. Uh, Bit for next hack occurred, uh, what, two days ago? Uh, oh, to, well, uh, the, the arrest occurred, yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, not the hack, yeah, 2016, that was. The arrest occurred. I, I don't know what your what thoughts are on this, but we were just talking about it before you joined. You've got, you know, Tweedledum and Tweedledee uh, that have been making TikToks and cringy stuff and raps. But then you've also got, like, her making, like, pretty impressive, like, social engineering and manipulation speeches and presentations. So I'm a little bit unsure on this, but, hey, they got caught. Um, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, you know, hey, uh, did, were these people likely the ones that did it? What happened? I mean, no one really knows, but I just wanted to see if you had any kind of initial speculative thoughts on this whole thing. You know, I'm, I'm still trying to take it all in and, and form an opinion on it. I'm, I'm pretty, I try to be pretty slow to, to form opinions on things. And man, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of information that like the floodgates just kind of opened when the news broke and there was a lot of info out there. And I, I think a lot of the, the um, different hypotheses they, they all kind of make sense. Um, I, I can see it from multiple angles. But, you know, at the end of the day, like those, those are the people that were arrested. And, um, you know, I, I think it's more likely than not that they actually were the hackers, um, it, it, as opposed to this being some sort of like elaborate cover up or some elaborate conspiracy. I think it just comes down to the truth being stranger than fiction sometimes. That's a pretty fair, fair answer. I'm kind of with you on that one, right? It's like we don't really know the full situation. There's tons of stuff getting leaked and you know it's like uh who knows what happens i think ricardo you were saying that you essentially thought more yeah like from, basically from the other side of the argument i heard those rap songs that she made and i find it extremely hard to believe that they were um they had the technological prowess to hack it in the first place and then the way they cashed out was so amateur it doesn't add up to me um whether they were like the the money launderers instead of the hackers as some people have put forth um, I guess that could make a little more sense. Maybe they weren't as as um, adept at you know doing things anonymously and stuff like that. But um, it to me something doesn't add up. It doesn't seem like they would be intellectually um, sharp enough to do it. Yeah, no, man. She's she's uh, she's joined. Uh, I think isn't it uh, Jay Z, Dr. Dre as as one of the billionaire rappers in the world, right? Uh, so right. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was a good. Meme. Songs are awful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's an absolute nightmare, man. But um, no, I'll, I'll move on because obviously all we can do is speculate right at the end of the day. But I thought I had to bring it up. Right. It's too topical not to, to raise it. That is the, when it comes to yourself, I, I don't know, like if you want to introduce yourself or, but I suppose, like, hey, man, like what if you're at a, at a party or whatever, maybe not a party, an online party, because I don't know, whatever, and you've got to introduce yourself to someone like, hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what I give a damn about in the world. And like, this is why I give a shit about Bitcoin and like where, where that came from, how I came across this thing. Like, what would you say? Like, how, how would you introduce yourself uh, if, you, if you had to do it? You know, I, I would just start with, with what I like to do. I like to keep it pretty simple. You know, I, I try to have a laser focus on interacting with Bitcoin uh, through self-custody, uh, censorship resistance, keeping it permissionless. And, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that goes into that you know, like hardware wallets, steel backups, home mining, non-KYC, trading on biz, buying from an ATM, but like using a, a de-Googled phone with like Calyx OS flashed on it. So there's a ton of tools out there that can help people do those three basic things, interact with Bitcoin, using self-custody, keeping it permissionless and censorship resistant. And so, you know, I try to, I would I would just try and like pique their interest as to like what censorship resistance means and what kind of like 
problems that might solve for them. So, you know, I think people who have had financial hardships in their life tend to understand what's what the value proposition is behind permissionless, what the value proposition is behind censorship resistance. If you've ever had your wages garnished, where the state comes in and takes money out of your paycheck before it even hits your bank account, you understand the importance of censorship resistance by default. You know, if you've ever like had a loved one who's got an addiction problem and they are putting themselves in dangerous situations where there's cash in hand and drugs involved in person and they've been robbed at gunpoint or they've been harmed in that process, then you understand the importance of being able to make those transactions people don't want you to make in a safe way that's online and massively distant in geographic terms. So, you know, I'm talking about like buying on a dark net market or something. And, you know, if you've had a loved one that has drug problems, like, you know what it's like to see someone who's genuinely a good person, but just needs some help getting through the day. And you understand that person, um, you know, and if you um, have ever tried to like open a bank account and been rejected and haven't been able to have access to those types of financial services, or if you've been trying to run a, a business that just isn't aligned with your financial institution's moral compass, and you've had your bank account shut down and therefore have had troubles with your business, like that permissionless censorship resistance peer-to-peer -peer model really makes sense to people who have had problems with legacy finances. And you know, I think Bitcoin solves for a lot of those problems. Gotcha, man. I mean, that it gives an insight to the kind of guy you are. Like, clearly, you care about other people and like people's freedoms, right? I mean, so I was going to ask like why specifically you would care about other people being able to learn about like uh, mining at home and like privacy and using Calyx and things. But obviously, that kind of answers the question. Like, it's clear. I mean, uh, coming from someone who has firsthand experience trying to get a business going and then bank shuts you down, bank shuts you down, bank shuts you down, and it's a fucking right. nightmare. Spoke to Vlad Costia a while back, and he's a big proponent of like decentralizing mining by having everybody like instead of running their own node, like actually run their own miner at home. And um, he's like a big supporter of these like weaker ASICs. They're not like the same ASICs that they use in big mining operations. They're like smaller, quieter ones that you could like run in your bedroom. Um, what are your opinions on on mining at home and like what kind of machines is it that you run? Yeah, so like when I first started, I, I got like an industrial grade, uh, like a, a Watts miner, M31S plus, which is, it was specced out at 82 terahash. So it's like the traditional ASIC that you see that it's as loud as a jet engine and as hot as a furnace. And um, so, yeah, I plugged this thing into my home underneath my kid's room down in the basement and quickly had to figure out how I was going to deal with the heat and the noise. And that kind of started the, the whole like documenting process of the home mining article that, that a lot of people have uh, found useful that I published. But um, you know, to the point of decentralization, yeah, I mean, there's products out there like Futurebit, they make a device called the Apollo, and that thing will hash like two to four terahash. And yeah, I think it's absolutely great. Like imagine if we had like 10 million of those out there in the wild, and you had that much hash rate being controlled by people that aren't going to get shut down if regulators clamp down on them. You know, like uh, what digital or uh, Galaxy Digital, that company, Galaxy Digital, they put out a report recently, just last month. And in that report, they had a prediction for the end of 2022 that up to 45% of Bitcoin hash rate is going to be controlled by publicly traded miners. And when I hear publicly traded, I think like susceptible to regulations, uh, they have to answer to investors. They can't just like go rogue and do whatever they want. It, they, they have to be careful because there's a lot of like venture capital and investment involved. And so when it comes down to like making decisions about what to do with that hash rate, are they going to prioritize the tenants of censorship resistance or are they going to prioritize like what the investors want and, and maintaining that bottom line? You know, and I think it's going to be the latter, unfortunately. And so if it really came down to it, it 
I think it could be a precarious situation where so much of Bitcoin's hash rate is in the hands of people that are more likely to comply if regulators start clamping down on these big miners. But if there's like a bunch of devices out there like the Apollo or these USB miners or just like even a S9 doing like 13 terahash, like the government's not going to be able to clamp down on 10 million users. You know what I mean? So I think it's very important for people to be hashing even if it's only a little bit, because every single hash that's produced has a equal probability of solving for a block. And as we've seen, there's been five really small miners this year that have solved for a block on that solo CK pool. You know, that's almost 32 Bitcoin that's gone straight from the network to individuals. I think that's a beautiful thing. What would you recommend for someone that's interested in getting started, like mining at home? Yeah, I, I would start small for sure. Start small and start simple. And, you know, think about what your living situation is. Think about like who you're living with. Do you have family? Do you have roommates? Are you in your apartment? You know, there's, uh, there's as many unique situations as there are people and there's not going to be like one solution that, that suits all of them. Um, but, you know, there are a ton of creative people out there coming up with awesome solutions every day. And those people are very happy to share their experiences on Twitter and on Telegram. There's a lot of chat channels you can get into and, and find some advice for people who are, for example, mining in an apartment and look at the kinds of things they have done to mitigate the noise and the heat that these industrial grade miners produce. You know, so at, the first thing I would say is just kind of think about your situation and what you want to do and what problems you're trying to solve. And if you think like a big, powerful miner is the answer for you, then, you know, the next logical step is to try and think about how you're going to mitigate the heat and that noise. Um, if that's too much, then yeah, you know, look at solutions like Future Bits Apollo or those, um, those USB sticks, I forget what they're called, like Gecko something, Gecko Science, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's simple devices out there that will run very quietly. They won't consume a lot of electricity. Um, they won't produce a lot of heat, but they will get you up and hashing and you'll be participating in the network. You know, you may never solve a block, but I think anyone who's interested in doing that at a really tiny micro scale is, is more interested in the ethos and the learning experience. Right. I guess also like, um, something you touched on when you said about, I think, was it 45, 42% uh, of the uh, hash, hash rate, et cetera, being with um, sort of, well, publicly traded uh, companies. Something um, that was brought up, and I can't remember who it was brought up by, but one of the guys we've had on recently, who's from a big mining company, uh, he was saying essentially that he, then- I think it was Charlie Schumacher from Marathon. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, Charlie from Marathon. It was like their estimation would be that basically energy companies would be the, well, people doing most of the mining, right? Because it makes a lot of sense. They've got all this excess energy or they're creating the energy and then they're going to want to be able to monetize it, do something with it. Uh, so he was kind of saying that. And then it kind of makes me think, and I guess at the time I hadn't thought about this, but then it makes me realize, well, shit, yeah, you know, you could get like 60, 70%, 40% of the hash rate basically controlled by what energy companies want. And that would be like the overwhelming thing and it kind of just sounds like the u.s political system where like whoever donates gets what they want it's like well whoever owns the energy companies it kind of just feels very centralized so i guess the the overwhelming thought in my mind is like well the best way to get around that is to participate even if it's just as you say like a small small amount and if enough people realize and do that then it helps take away that sort of centralized power i suppose so that's like another Beyond the learning and the, and the kind of ethos, it's more like, hey, you know, if you want Bitcoin to actually remain useful and your personal investments to remain good financially, the selfish reason is to start mining for that purpose. Do you see, uh, you spoke about like the heat generation and the sound. Like, did you, uh, I saw something on Twitter, I don't know, maybe like a week ago or two, uh, this guy who'd uh, um, like re rerouted the heat generated by his miner to like warm up kittens outside, like stray kittens in like a thing. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I saw that. Yeah, it, it was awesome. And, you know, that just go, that ties into what I was saying about the creative solutions. You know, people are coming up with all sorts of awesome ways to help, like, reduce their power consumption in other areas, like heating their home. And, you know, some people are, are donating their heat to kittens outside. <laughs> As someone who's never mind, like, how much heat are we talking about? Like, if you had it in your room, 
would it make your room uncomfortably warm like in, after a short yeah time? yeah so when when i first got my my first asic and fired it up it was in a room like a standard size room maybe like 12 feet by 10 feet and after about an hour the room it had heated up to 80 degrees and that was just going to keep accumulating so the the output fan of the asic is running about 150 degrees fahrenheit so it, it's a pretty substantial amount of heat you know it's um the energy used is like a, a one-to-one -one ratio with the heat produced so like imagine like a 3000 watt space heater that's equivalent to what the ASIC's going to produce in heat i guess uh, a question which i don't know i mean it's kind of pulling away slightly from mine but not really um we've kind of discussed we've mentioned why you should give a damn as a human being, uh, basically, even if you're being selfish, uh, in, in mining, uh, what obviously privacy is, an, is another, like a big impact for you. Like you, you mentioned people like getting, um, oh God, my words, uh, Google device, Google phone, I can't remember what it's called now, the Google, the Google phone, whatever it's called, uh, and using Calyx, uh, flashing Calyx onto it, uh, things like that. So I suppose my question here, because we've spoken to a few privacy advocates about this before, like, what do you think needs to be done to encourage more people to give a damn about their privacy when it comes to like Bitcoin transacting, but just also in general, like, cause it feels to me like uh, a lot of people really don't care until they, something really impacts them in their personal lives. Like, right. I guess like, is there anything that comes to your mind? Cause obviously you've been doing this for a while, like writing about it, trying to help people. Like what do you find is something that actually causes people to, to care without them having some, horrible life experience that then kind of forces them to care yeah you know unfortunately i, I think you hit the nail on the head and it, it's not until people need it that they they realize the benefit of it and they just kind of brush it off in the in the meantime or they they put themselves in the state of mind of like this defeatist mentality where it's like well i don't have anything to hide i don't really care i don't really care if google's scanning my photos that i have uploaded to the cloud I don't really care if they're reading my SMS text messages, you know, and it, it's not until something drastic happens that, that they realize what the risks are, you know, and um, even though people, privacy advocates, myself included, will try and like scream about this from the rooftops and like try to warn people about the red flags, a lot of times I'm just greeted with like, oh, that's FUD. You're just, you know, you're just an anarchist who who's fudding like just let people do what they want to do there's there's no major consequences and little by little you know i, I think they're all going to find out you know the, the especially as like cancel culture gets um into full swing here like look at what's happening with like joe rogan you know and it's it's like you can watch that happen to other people but at a certain point like it's going to happen to you you're going to wind up on the wrong side of that pendulum one of these days and it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and it's going to happen to everybody you know and it, it's like just look at what's happened with the pandemic and they're trying to take away the your own bodily autonomy like you no longer get a choice of what gets injected into your body or at least they don't want you to have that choice anymore they want the vaccines to be forced upon you and so if you think that that can happen uh and something as minimal as like refusing banking services to a person who's not fully vaccinated isn't going to happen. You're just kidding yourself. Like the, this, the wheels have been set in motion. They have been for many, many years. And it's just a matter of time before you find yourself canceled, you know, and then, and then what are you going to do? So I just encourage people to really think about like, you know, what, what do you value? Do you value being able to communicate with your family? Do you value being able to have access to your money? Do you value being able to like move freely? If these are things you value, like start taking precautions, start taking measures, start making those little incremental steps today to start protecting the things that you want because there's an entire world encroaching on your freedoms. And it's not going to stop. It's just going to keep going and keep going. And you need to make a decision where you're going to draw the line. And wherever you draw that line, like you need to be prepared to guard that line and 
fortunately, we're all able to communicate with each other pretty well right now and share all these awesome privacy tools that are out there and help people like figure this stuff out and incorporate it into their like good habits and start building good privacy practices. Um, but you know, one, like what happens when my account gets censored from Twitter, you know, like there goes an audience of 20,000 followers that I can no longer talk about privacy with, you know, what happens when I get expelled from telegram, like there goes all the channels I'm in, you know, and it, it can happen and it has happened. And I think it's going to continue happening. I feel like, uh, there's gotta be a, I mean, to me, and I, I don't know if I'm being ignorant, but there's got to be a point where so it's like, there's got to be a point where like, and like enough or like someone high up enough in people's estimations gets canceled or deplatformed, et cetera, where it becomes like, okay, this is too much. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there has got to be something in society where it's like, okay, you know, it's kind of like the alien invasion where like, no one really pays any attention to what's going on in the world, but then literally aliens land and point a alien ray gun in your face. And it's like, okay, well now I've got to pay attention to this thing. Um, I feel like there's got to be that point. And I, I my thought, go back two weeks ago was like, Hey, Joe Rogan's surely it, right? Like he's the most popular podcast in the world to my knowledge, or at least in the English speaking world. So that was like, it's gotta be, but then I feel like I've seen quite a lot of people. And again, this could just be Twitter bots, et cetera, but quite a lot of people saying, Oh no, you know, he said the N word and da da da, which he said pre 2019. Uh, I'm not saying I support him saying it, but like, it seems odd that it's now suddenly come out now. <laughs> like what, <laughs> like why, why are we, why are we suddenly, you know, what? Like it's, it's the past. Yeah. Why are we suddenly, I don't know, whatever. But um, I don't know, man. Like, do you think there's a, do you foresee there being a point? Cause for example, what could happen here is Joe Rogan gets deplatformed by Spotify, maybe. Right. Um, and then he ends up joining Adam Curry and doing podcasting 2.0. Uh, we had him as a guest the other week. Awesome dude. And, and, and it'd be great to see that. And then that obviously becomes hand in hand with lightning and like the way that they've, they've been funded with that. And then it's like, okay, uh, cash apps brought lightning in maybe, you know, other big companies look at, and with that, it's kind of like, um, could that be our saving grace, right? Like centralized big companies that you may not necessarily trust actually embracing something for their own selfish benefit that just happens to also be like a community power kind of decentralized option. Um, maybe that's it. I don't know. Like, do you think there, is there a point in your head where you're like, okay, surely at this point, people have to realize something and then we're going to have this like shift and the pendulum's going to swing back the other direction. Or are you kind of more just like, hey, we're screwed. <laughs> like, what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think that that tipping point is is different for every individual, you know, and and for me, that tipping point is way behind me. Like that point has come and gone and I am like doing everything I can to live a sovereign life, you know, and and I'm trying to like hold on to the things that I value and I'm trying to protect my privacy and I'm trying to share the the tools that I use and like the ways that I use them so that people can learn, you know, while I still have my voice, because I do think it's just a matter of time before I say something too based and I get canceled. And, you know, unfortunately, like, gonna have to try and build back up from zero. And that's, that's just not realistic. You know, it's, it's you can't replicate what I'm doing and, and like what the, what my, for lack of a better term, what my brand has become, you know, um, but yeah, I, I do think that, that that tipping point's different for everybody. And you really just kind of have to look at within yourself and decide like what, how much are you going to take? How much are you going to compromise? How much are you going to give up? How long are you going to watch your friends and family suffer needlessly? How long are you going to watch your rights get taken away? Like the world you were born in does not exist any longer. And how long are you going to keep venturing down this path before you start rejecting this dystopia? You know, they, they, they talk about like the American dream. It's, it's somebody's dream is that's not my dream. I don't, I don't want people to have to get forced to be vaccinated. I don't want people's movements to be restricted. That's not my dream. I'm not going to live like that. I don't want my wife to have to have a job because we need to have two incomes. I, I reject that dystopia. No, my wife, stays home and she takes care of the kids and she always has. And I'm always going to do everything I can to ensure that because that's what I value. You know, I value that more traditional family unit. And I do think that there is a war being waged on the family unit. They don't even want us having Thanksgiving together any longer. They don't want us congregating together in church. And it's just, 
you know, everybody's just kind of got to look at the world around them and, and just pause for a minute and think about what are, what are we doing here? You know, you, you only get one life. How are you going to live it? Why not, why not make the world be the change you want to see in the world? Make it the place you want to live. Don't just accept it because some psychopath who has all the power is like trying to enforce this dystopian nightmare on us. I reject that. No, that's fair. I um, I think uh, well, something something that's quite and, and, and I'd agree that like everyone should kind of. I'm obviously very libertarian in my views or whatever. Like everyone should have the rights to do what they think is right and for them and their family, etc. Like that should be it, right? Like if you want to do something your way and it's not hurting anyone else in a in a horrible way, go for it. Uh, that's kind of the way I feel like we should live. Um, and one of the things that's key, obviously, to your ethos etc is as i say the privacy but like the bitcoin right bitcoin is like a key part of it uh it's why we're all here today probably at least this is why i have this my entire life <laughs> it's like why i have a job i suppose so a question which is a bit of a segue i suppose but bitcoin isn't exactly the most from from the ground up from its basic construction isn't the most privacy pro thing i mean the bit for next uh, hackers got caught I mean, it was, it's not easy to launder $3.6 billion or $4.2 billion worth of Bitcoin, as we all can now very clearly see. Uh, so I suppose when it comes to privacy, like, do you, have you ever used, I, I assume you've probably given it some time of day or some thought, but have you ever used Monero and like considered Monero? And like, what, what are your thoughts on that uh, as like an alternative to Bitcoin with the privacy baked in from the base layer? Yeah, yeah, I've used Monero. Um, I like Monero. I don't think Monero is a shit coin. Um, I think, you know, and if we think about it in, in a couple of different ways here. So if we're talking like store of value, no, I don't think Monero does that. I don't think it does that very well. Sometimes I don't think Bitcoin even does that very well. You know, we're just coming off of like being down 50% from an all-time high. So, you know, Bitcoin is king. Like it, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Like get used to using Bitcoin. It's, it's number one. It is always going to be number one. And, you know, that, that's the, that's absolutely my primary focus is Bitcoin. Um, but like you mentioned, Bitcoin has some, it has a blind spot and that blind spot is the privacy aspect of it. And so what I think Monero is useful for is a tool to help fill in that blind spot to help you make sure that you're using Bitcoin with the utmost privacy that you can. So like one example is if you run your Bitcoin through a Samurai Wallet's Whirlpool implementation, their CoinJoin implementation, you're gonna have a little bit of change left over from that transaction. And you need to be careful what you do with that change because the previous transaction history is still linked to that change even though the rest of your coins have gone through Whirlpool and they now have forward looking anonymity, that change is still kind of like this UTXO that you need to figure out what you're going to do with. And if you spend it without like taking any additional steps, then whoever you spend it to will be able to see that all the transaction history that was linked to it and that you did the Whirlpool transaction. So one thing you can do is an atomic swap to Monero with that toxic change UTXO. And then you have uh, Monero that is untraceable. And you can either you know, use that to spend something where like you can't take any risks of privacy whatsoever because that's what Monero is hardened to do. Or um, you can eventually swap it back to Bitcoin and then you have Bitcoin that's not linked to any of that previous transaction history you had or the entry point into Whirlpool. Um, so I think in that sense, using Monero as a tool to just help bolster that like last remaining step, like that last yard, like we've gone like nine yards with Whirlpool and that, um, that last yard, I think Monero helps fill that, that gap that we have. I'm speaking in yards. It's a that's like an American football uh, analogy. That's all good. I got you. I'm a huge oh. NFL fan. Sorry, Ricardo. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I wanted to interrupt here. Um, to take it back to uh, you know, like the limitations of centralized platforms like Twitter 
and the likes. Have you uh, personally like experimented at all with the Fediverse, the federated um, like open source alternative social media? And yeah, also, yeah. you have? Well, I've tried okay. um, Mastodon. I, okay. I've got a like a Mastodon account. So that's like a federated, um, you know, social media platform that tries to kind of emulate Twitter just for any listeners that don't know. And, um, you, you know, the, the more important one for me recently has been a YouTube alternative called PeerTube. And I really dislike um, the way YouTube operates and um, the way that they'll like take your video down if you have a song in there that you don't have a license to use that song for, uh, even though you're not like generating any money. Um, you know, just and, and just the way they can like censor people and, and large like Bitcoin magazine had their account, their YouTube account censored like while they're in the middle of like a live stream. Um, so, yeah, I, I spun up my own like virtual private server and I loaded a peer tube instance on there. And so I host my own server where now I can I have a place to like put the videos that I use in my tutorials and then I can just link to my own. Uh, video server in my blogs. So if I'm trying to like demonstrate like a, a steel plate fire test or something, and I take a video of it, I can host that myself on my own server now. And PeerTube offers that like familiar interface that kind of emulates YouTube's interface. And uh, it, so it's familiar to the user. And, you know, it, it's a platform that can't just get shut off because someone doesn't like what I'm saying. A follow-up question to that is, did you hear the announcement that came out either yesterday or the day before about Blue Sky, which is like Jack Dorsey's federated decentralized version of Twitter? And do you have any opinion on it? I, I've heard that uh, talked about. I'm familiar with the term Blue Sky, but I haven't looked at it at all. Uh -huh. I, I do remember like during the Bitcoin 2021 conference, Jack Dorsey was saying something to the effect of like, I am coming up with a censorship resist or maybe censorship resistant isn't the right term, but like a, a platform where people aren't gonna get censored. Um, give me time, I'm working on it. And I think he was alluding to, to Blue Sky, right? Yeah, I think so. They just recently, I saw an article uh, from Reclaim the Net, I think it was where they took the announcement that they're working on Blue Sky Public, and I think he's going to be the CEO of it now, and all that stuff. I've been trying to unpack your kind of person, and um, I just want to know what, because I went through your, you know, to the profile, and I saw where you were yelling, you know, no, no more laws, you no know, get rid of the lawmakers, and all of that. And I know some people do have some pretty, I wouldn't call it extreme let's just say extreme views about how they think the world should be. You know, they say you get rid of laws, no tax, yeah, passionate, thank you. You get rid of laws, no more taxes, you know, get rid of the police, you know, all of that. And what would the ideal world for you look like? You know, no taxes, um, uh, no police or, you know, community policing. How would the world, like the world, like if you would were to create your own world, how would it look like, your own society? That's a really good question. And, you know, I, I can't say that I, I'm totally prepared. I, d I haven't really been thinking about what my ideal world is, but I do know what, what I don't like and what's not working for me in the world that I live in. And, you know, one, one thing, like when it comes to taxes, for example, you hear a lot of people say like, Oh yeah, just just get rid of all taxes. We shouldn't pay any taxes. And then you know the immediate counter argument is, well, who's going to build the roads and all this other stuff? Look, when, when I'm when I'm talking about taxes, like the the one that really chaps my ass is the federal income tax. So when we talk about roads, like here in the United States, our roads are maintained by the tax dollars we pay at the gas pump. Okay. Our schools are maintained by the taxes we pay on our property, okay? Th that is totally different than the federal income tax. Now, the federal income tax is used, it's, it's taken out of your paycheck by your employer before it ever hits your bank account, 
and it's used to pay the interest on the cash that the Federal Reserve is printing for the US Treasury. This is something I have a problem with. I, I, have, I do take issue with the federal income tax, and I do think the Federal Reserve should be abolished. You know, and this is where like Bitcoin comes in, a, a completely alternative financial system that can directly replace the existing financial system. And if, if we think about like what is happening with the, with the federal income tax, we have this, this federal reserve system that's, it's controlled by a group of people that aren't voted in. So they're not representative of the population. I don't get any say in what that monetary policy looks like. You know, not, none of the people in the United States, none of the citizens get to say what their monetary policy looks like. They can just print as much money as they want. And in doing so, they're debasing the purchasing power of the money that I'm trying to hold on to with dear life as a savings. So if I just keep my money in a bank, the more money they print, they don't even have to have access to my bank account. It's like the greatest hack ever. They, they can just print more money and it devalues the money that I, I, I have been trying to save. So I take all of my like hardworking efforts and put in my time and energy into a job to earn this money for income. And then I take that income and try and hold on to it so that I can make plans for the future and do something for my children down the road. Meanwhile, this out of control monetary policy that is operated by the Federal Reserve is just siphoning away that purchasing power so that by the time I go back to do something with that money, it, it doesn't go as far as it should. And I'm not getting the value that is proportional to the effort I put into creating it in the first place. So, so then you take, you, you, you're taking a, a monetary policy and a, a system like that, and then you're taking money out of my paycheck to pay the interest on it. Like you're already like debasing the shit out of the value that I'm trying to hold on to, And then you're making me pay the interest on it so that the private corporation, the Federal Reserve that's printing the money can make a profit on what they're supplying to the US Treasury. So like I'm stuck in this position where I have no say in how it works. I can't like vote or change any of the people that are involved with it. It's, it's operating in such a way that it strips the purchasing power of the money that I have. And I'm the one who has to generate the profit for the Federal Reserve to do it. That is what I have a problem with when I talk about taxes. Now, as far as like the police and like the state, you know, my opinion is that all governments trend toward tyranny. And just look at what has happened in the last couple of years. I mean, for the love of God, I saw a video yesterday of a woman being dragged naked out from like a dog pile of police officers and just beaten to the ground in New Zealand. Like, I, I don't know what happened to her clothes, like, but dude, like the violence has just been escalating and escalating. And if, if, that's, if that is what we need police for, then I really think we need to like reevaluate what the role of police officers is because I don't think that's what we need them for, you know? Do police play a role in a society? I, I think they're probably here for a reason. They could play a role, but like, have they taken that too far? Have we really started to descend down the path of tyranny like worldwide? From my vantage point, I'd say, yeah. And, you know, I'm not gonna say like abolish the police force, but I will say that we're on a clear trajectory toward tyranny and the agents of the state, the police especially, are being used as a tool to, that's being weaponized against the citizens. And I think there's something wrong there. I guess to me, um, it feels like if you look at human history, and I suppose harder to do this for the US for, for me because I, I, I've only visited once. So I, if I look at, if I'm being selfish and look at the UK, right, I, I can see the history and, and generally humanity is like, you know, you have kings and queens and maybe before that you have leaders of like certain areas and whatever. And then, so it's kind of been very centralized and you have like Magna Carta and it's like a slightly better system. And then, you know, you had the House of Lords and then they kind of slowly lost a bit of power. So things kind of just slowly became slightly more fair to people very gradually. 
Um, and then you look at policing as well, and you look at the early 1900s where like, you got your finger chopped off for stealing a loaf of bread or whatever. And then you look at the 80s where, you know, if you were a different race, you just probably got beaten up in the back of a car and no one knew. It feels to me like we've only really been super gradually getting better with this kind of stuff, like uh, having a fairer system and having fairer police forces, et cetera. And, and, and really, we haven't actually changed all that much from like the 80s or the 1900s. And it's been a very gradual change, but it feels to me like we all felt and assumed or imagined in the, over the last 20 years, like we'd kind of gone like this and then suddenly it got way better and like everything was much better, much better. And then COVID's kind of actually just exposed that no, it hasn't. Really, it's only got very marginally better from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. That's kind of how I feel. Like this stuff's kind of probably always been there, but with the internet and with people... Um, not being able to work and, and, and having nothing to do, they've suddenly all paid attention and realized that actually we aren't much better than we were. And, you know, we are all human beings and we are animals. <laughs> like it's kind of, um, so I feel like I've kind of just, I've been exposed to the fact that maybe I had higher, more innocent hopes for the where humanity is right now. Um, and that realistically, we're actually still on this gradual scale and maybe things like adopting Bitcoin uh, getting rid of uh, or making more of like a, a local community effort when it comes to taxation and things like that is just the, the next sort of gradual step in the right direction. I don't know what your thoughts on that because it's like I'm very dystopian, but I, I feel like this is maybe the least dystopian view I can have is that actually maybe we just overassumed how good things were and actually we're just gradually getting better and we just got to keep moving in that in that in that sort of force. I was about to say I was uh, since we were you know talking about you know how society is you know obviously devolving. You know, in regards to how we treat people, what are your thoughts on? Um, we uh, a couple of months ago, um, uh, El Salvador president act announced on the Bitcoin city, and if he, I don't, what do you think about you know, you know, Bukele as a person? Before I go into my next question, well, you know, I think that El Salvador adopting Bitcoin, it's it's a state adopting Bitcoin. And, you know, like I said before, I think all states trend toward tyranny. And, you know, as a person, the president of El Salvador, I think, has exhibited um, authoritative tendencies. And, you know, I think it's important for people to understand about Bitcoin that, you know, Bitcoin is just software. A lot of people try to, like, associate their moral compass or their ideals or you know their desires they try to like make it seem like bitcoin is this thing outside of software and it, it's really just software so it, it it's really just a tool and you put a tool like that in the hands of an individual who's trying to have sovereignty and protect their own privacy and their own freedoms, that can be a very powerful tool toward those ends. But if you take that same tool and put it in the hands of someone who has authoritative tendencies, well, it can also be a very powerful tool towards those ends as well. And so I think we're going to see um, something interesting happen in El Salvador, no matter what. I hope it's a good thing, but I can't help but think that um, in the hands of an authoritative president, Bitcoin's not going to be what people thought it was going to be going into El Salvador. Okay, nice, um, uh, because uh, Bukele did announce that they are going to be you know, launching the Bitcoin city, you know, zero taxes and all that, you know, you know stuff that, you know, uh, Bitcoiners do like. Do you see yourself actually living in the, in, um, the Bitcoin city? No, I don't. I don't think so. I'm pretty happy where I'm at. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> maybe maybe oh. I'll take a vacation there one day, but no, I'm I'm going to stay put for the long term. Uh, you mentioned that you use pri uh, privacy wallets and stuff like that, and you also mentioned Samurai. Like, what's mm. your go-to stack of like apps to help you maintain your privacy? Yeah, if we're talking like mobile, uh, mobile wallet, then, you know, I use an Android phone and I've flashed Calyx OS on it. And so the go-to Bitcoin wallet for me on that device is Samurai Wallet. It's an Android only wallet. Um, they've implemented the Whirlpool coin join implementation. They've got a few different uh, post-mix spending tools that help you maintain that 
that privacy gain by going through the whirlpool uh, as you spend that Bitcoin later. Um, you know, they're constantly developing new and improved features in the wallet. So um, if we're like talking desktop, then my favorite wallet for desktop is Sparrow Wallet. Uh, Sparrow Wallet has like a super clean interface. It's really like uh, user friendly, it's intuitive. And it also has like all these advanced features. It's basically like a miniature block explorer in the wallet. Um, they've also integrated and implemented uh, Samurai Wallet's Whirlpool. So you can actually mix from desktop now on Sparrow. Um, and so there, there's all these advanced features that like, if you're an advanced user, you can really dig into it and get a lot out of it. Or if you're like a new user who's never used a Bitcoin wallet before, it's like super user friendly and easy to like start wrapping your mind around some of those concepts. So yeah, like desktop and mobile, those are my two go-to Bitcoin wallets. What about Wasabi? Wasabi, so I have tried Wasabi in the past. Um, and, you know, as time has gone on, I've developed uh, an opinion of Wasabi that, that uh, leaves something to be desired. I, I don't like Wasabi. I, I don't recommend it. Um, I think they've got some problems in their wallet that are deal breakers for me. You know, so for example, like some of their mixes exhibit what's called symmetrical address reuse, where you have the same address on the input side of the transaction and the same address on the output side of the, of the transaction. And so if you're a participant in that mixing transaction and there's the same address on the input and output, well, that reduces the anonymity set of the rest of the users that are involved in that mix. And just the fact that the coordinator, the Wasabi coordinator uh, allows something like that to happen in a transaction um, signals to me that they, they haven't put in the proper zero link implementation protocols in place to ensure that every mix is a zero link coin join. So I just, I just can't recommend Wasabi. They are coming out with Wasabi Wallet 2.0, which, you know, I would hope is an improvement, but, you know, based on what I've seen so far, it doesn't look like it's heading that direction if, from my perspective. That's interesting. I uh, appreciate that. I, um, cause we've spoken to the Wasabi guys a few times on here. And so I've never got that, um, take on it. So that's gonna be interesting. I'm going to look at it. Uh, I think, um, a question I had for you actually before uh, we came in here, and, and I kind of usually don't like to come up with stuff I want to ask too much before the pod because I think it's just easier to see what we're talking about and go with it. But uh, a question I had was uh, when it comes to mining and people doing so from home, whether it's on like a tiny scale or a large scale, like, would you, having talked to these like your brains and, and, and uh, Mercury, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would you... Uh, recommend to people that they join a mining pool at all um, and if so like what one and why I guess yeah definitely so I would definitely recommend joining a mining pool if you're a small miner you know maybe if you have like 20 petahash you can kind of if you're at that level like you can start thinking about branching off on your own to your own pool um, but the nice things about joining a mining pool is that you don't have to have any additional infrastructure beyond your ASIC, your, own, your miner. You know, you don't have to have your own Bitcoin node configured. You don't have to have a stratum server. You don't have to like configure all that stuff. The node takes care of all of that infrastructure that kind of goes on behind the scenes. And the, the, the main benefit of joining a mining pool is that if you're a participant to a pool and that pool solves a block, then you're going to be rewarded proportional to the hash rate you were providing to the pool when they found that block. So you, you will steadily get a little bit of Bitcoin every day when you're mining with a pool. Whereas if you try to like do individual mining where you do set up your own node, yeah, you're providing hash to the network, but the chances of you finding a block by yourself like that are just so low that you might mine for 30 years straight and never find a block. Um, now there's, there's a few different kinds of payout schemes that pools use 
Um, so like Solo CK Pool, for example, they've been in the headlines recently because these solo miners have been finding blocks. Well, they're, they're a mining pool just like Slush Pool, but they pay out a little bit differently. So if you are a participant in CK Pool and you find a block, you get 98% of that block reward and the pool gets 2%. None of the other participants get any rewards. So that's why it's called like solo pool. It's not the same as like individual mining where you're running your own node infrastructure. Um, but when we talk about like um, participating with other miners um, and sharing those rewards, yeah, slush, slush pool has been my go-to pool that I recommend people uh, for a number of reasons. They've got a good history. Um, so they were the first Bitcoin mining pool. Uh, they were in support of small blocks during the block wars. Uh, they were the first pool to signal for taproot activation. They have a really well-designed and user-friendly interface that has a ton of data points on it that you can like monitor all the stats of your mining activity on their pool. Um, their payout scheme is called um, pay per last n shares. So like they average how many valid shares your miner is providing to the pool. And then when they find a block, you are rewarded based on those number of shares. And so if they don't find any blocks, then you don't get any rewards. So that's a little bit different from some other pools. Um, that do like a full pay per share where you basically just get, you know, like a steady stream of sats every day and it doesn't really fluctuate much. You know, one advantage with slush pool is if they go on a tear and they hit like 25 blocks in one day, well, you're making bank that day. The next day they might only find three blocks and you don't make as much. But I kind of like the, the variability with slush pool and, um, you know, it's really easy to get your miner hooked up to their pool. So, and they've also got a mobile app. So you can like link that up to your phone and keep an eye on your hash rate at home while you're out on the go. And um, yeah, they're definitely my, my go-to pool. Don't take this as me trying to dox you, but I know like energy is more expensive in some areas of the United States and cheaper in others. Um, are you in a place where it's, it's a like more favorable place to mine? So my wife and I just moved out of the, the Denver metro area. We lived there for many years. Um, and so my employer was talking about mandating vaccines and masks. And, and so it was just time for us to go. So we said, you know what? We've always wanted to live in the country. Let's go live in the country. So we moved out to a very rural area. Um, we moved far, far away from Denver. We're still in the inner mountain west. Um, so to your question, when we moved here, I was told that I was on a nine cent per kilowatt hour rate. Well, I plugged in my ASIC and got my first electric bill. And I was very surprised to see that um, it was not nine cents a kilowatt hour. That only lasted for the first 500 kilowatt hours. And then after that, it jumped up to 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so my bill was a lot more than I had anticipated. Um, but even at that, you know, it is still, um, I, I am still mining like at a, at a more than break even rate, you know, so it still makes sense for me economically to be mining. Um, you know, if you've been following me for a while, you might've seen that, like I put a shipping container in my backyard where I'm gonna be like building out my one petahash Bitcoin mine. Um, so right now I just got like two ASICs running in my basement, but you know, I'm trying to get the utility company to run a new service out to my shipping container and get the electricians to put in the panels. And then I'll have all of my ASICs running in that shipping container. And, you know, a little known fact about utility companies is that they all have these tariffs that you can look into and find. They just don't volunteer that information. And so you can go through their tariffs if you can find them and you can like find what situation you're in that fits a tariff. And if you find one that's better than your like default rate that you get, your default residential rate, you can call your power company and say, hey, I saw this rate designation in your tariffs and this makes more sense for me. Can we talk about it and get me on this different rate? So like if you're like consuming like say 50 kilowatts 
a lot of companies, a lot of power companies have like these like thresholds where you get better and better deals. And so anyone who's um, looking at, you know, mining and consuming more energy, just know that you don't have to be stuck with that default residential rate you get from your power company. You can at least, at the very least, get like a, a peak demand rate or find some other program that they advertise. But if you dig a little deeper, like you'll find the, pl the published tariffs for your electric company. And in there, you'll find the, the really good rates. And, but they just don't advertise that. They don't volunteer that information. Just popped into my mind. I saw a guy a while back, a video where he got these Tesla uh, roof uh, tiles that they designed. The, and I just remember watching this video. It was kind of interesting to see you know, his experience and how it works. And yeah, you know, he had like issues where there was like uh, fires nearby, forest fires, because there's lots of smog and et cetera that blocked it. But um, question here, like, do, do you know of anyone who has got this kind of setup with like these like solar panels, uh, like, you know, like home wind, farm, like all these kinds of options for free energy that they've then tried to mine utilizing just that energy and kind of seeing how far they can go or how much it can offset their bill. Because I'm thinking that's the perfect situation, right? Is if you had this solar panel that was ultra amazing and could just soak in tons of energy and you're in a hot country and you just boom, put it straight into mining, you can just make free money once you've paid off the, the, the power of the, the cost of the panel. Uh, have you heard of anyone doing that kind of thing or like blogging that as an experiment? Because it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, there's there's definitely some people doing it. And I unfortunately, I don't recall what their names are off the top of my head, but I have seen them on Twitter. Um, I can try and like find them and um, send them to you after the show. And maybe you can like put it in the show notes or something. But um, yeah, you know, I think at the very least, it's a good way to like offset energy costs if it can like completely replace dependency on grid, that's even better. But then you're talking about a very substantial, robust, uh, large solar panel system or wind uh, energy generating system. You know, I, I think the, the, the real like balancing act here is that, you know, miners want reliable energy, um, not so much renewable energy. And because the, the renewable energy sources like solar, like you said, they had fires, there's smog in the air, the sun's not getting to the solar panels. It's not really reliable in that circumstance. You know, the solar panels aren't getting any sunlight at nighttime. Uh, you know, wind can be great when it's, when it's windy out, but when there's no wind, you're not getting any power. So I definitely like the idea of those energy sources for like su helping supplement your energy consumption, but I, I think it's definitely a good idea to have like a good reliable source and whether that's the grid or something like an oil and gas well, like what upstream data is doing. Full disclosure, I am affiliated with upstream data. Um, but you know, what they're doing is they're, you know, taking that, those like methane emissions that would have just been flared or vented off to atmosphere. And they're using that to run a natural gas generator that powers the ASICs. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my two cents on that. I got you. I'll be, yeah, I'll definitely be interested to, um, to see what people's findings are over time as well. Like the earliest people doing this, like trying to run like miners off of uh, renewable energy, that's the word I'm looking for. And then kind of how that moves forward over like the next couple of years and five years time 10 years because obviously it'd be interesting just to see how that evolves um i'm imagining a future where we have super powerful solar panels because that surely has to be because the sun is an amazing energy source right so i'm hopefully right. imagining a future where we have like insane energy panels like you know you got like a tesla that is electric and you don't have to plug it in because it just has a solar panel on its roof that just is powerful enough to just power the car that's my dream i guess so i'd love to see miners that are just running straight off of solar wind whatever it may be uh, that'd be amazing hydro even yeah i think block stream or um yeah block stream i think they have a hydro plant up north in the u.s or maybe in canada um but yeah i think hydro generation is a great use use case for um providing the energy requirements for asics yeah we'll close off i guess then it's been awesome uh economy to have you on man i uh i appreciate some of the insights you've given us around the mining and and kind of like the 
the, the bigger reasons, right? Like the whys behind privacy and things like that. It's interesting to get your perspective. Uh, I appreciate Thanks. it. And uh, you give me some things to think about as well, uh, especially reading up on the yeah people's experiments on mining. And uh, uh, and also now I can advise people what uh, mining pool is best for them when they're doing uh, home mining. So I appreciate that. But yeah, awesome. uh, but thanks so much, man. Is there anything you wanted to like, uh, yeah, let people know about before we head off at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate the invite and I'm sorry it took us so long to coordinate a time. Sorry for missing the last meeting, but I'm glad we did get to connect um, and I've enjoyed the conversation. And, you know, check out my blog, econoalchemist.com. I've got a lot of guides on censorship resistance, uh, permissionless, Bitcoin usage and self-custody. Um, check out Upstream Data. They've got the black box enclosure that's going to be going into full production here soon. That's an instant problem solver for home miners. Um, you can also find all my guides on Bitcoin Magazine's website. And um, yeah, you know, think about the future you want and, and make it happen and make Bitcoin a part of that vision. Damn right. Appreciate it. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks to you. Thanks to everyone out there listening. We hope that you've learned something new. Hope that you take this as a sign to think about at least uh, mining or, or if you can't uh, encouraging a friend or something to do so, or just to get them to listen or read the blog. Uh, as always, uh, we appreciate your time, whether you listen to us for a minute or an hour uh, and we love you lots. Uh, keep being awesome and keep buying Bitcoin. Uh, take care, everyone. See you later. Thank you.